Greetings, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our service where we worship Christ. Praise God. Today, I'll bring you a sermon named Before You Follow Jesus. And we're going to go to Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. It's an extensive passage with a lot in it. I hope we're not going to split in two and hope to complete the point what Jesus is trying to make in this passage in one session. As a way of introduction, I want to just introduce uh, the news. Silicon Valley Bank declared bankruptcy two days ago on March 10th, 2023. Silicon Valley Bank was the 16th largest bank in the United States at the time of its failure. And it was the largest bank by deposits in Silicon Valley. You can imagine what wealth was entrusted to this bank. Imagine trusting your own money into this bank. Maybe some of you did. This is a famous financial institution that you would think that they know what they're doing and how to avoid bankruptcy. And yet, they failed. As we read this passage, I want you to think about how serious Jesus is in this passage and how very serious he is about the system of salvation. He is exposing what will save a man or what will damn a man. And this is a super important for us because we must believe what saves a man in order to believe it to ourselves, and to preach it to others. Paul warns us in Galatians that if anybody comes and to preach you another gospel, even angel from heaven, let them be what? A curse. Very serious. And you might be thinking about this passage a little bit like I was thinking for all my life. I thought this passage is talking about us and about our reaction, and about our sacrifices to the gospel, for the gospel. I thought that Jesus is saying that in order to be a Christian, I must sacrifice for him. But it never made a complete sense to me because of the gospel. Because the gospel has no conditions. And when you say Jesus paid for me, so now I have to pay him blank, whatever you supply, the gospel ceases to be good news. This gospel is not about us. The gospel is about what Jesus did. We don't do the gospel. We merely believe in it. We don't produce the good news. We don't work for it because Jesus did it all when he said it is finished. And he was resurrected and it was complete. And it's a complete product because of Jesus. And because the gospel was complete, Jesus has been raised from the dead. And so now he's calling us to follow him. So get comfortable in your chairs, soft chairs, and try to heed to the spirit of Jesus. Whoever has ears, let them hear that Jesus would say. Let's read this. Verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and to be killed and be raised up on a third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are stumbling block to me for you are not set in your mind on God's interest, but man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, 
there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The point that I want to communicate to you this morning is that the hope of our salvation, the hope for your salvation is built on Jesus' sacrifice alone and not on your sacrifices. It's not on your sacrifices. It is, if you have any hope for salvation, it is Jesus in Jesus alone. Two sections are presented by Matthew here, and they are this. First, the necessity of Jesus' cross, and second is the necessity of your cross, our cross. So let's take it one by one. Verses 21 to 23, we talk about the necessity of Jesus' cross because Jesus talks about necessity of his cross. And it says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. You see, Jesus is presenting them the theology of suffering and theology of the cross because this is the saving theology. If you take away from your theology the cross, it is a damning theology. And Jesus is presented to the disciples who have no framework. They have no capacity to understand what is this cross is for. It says, we are about six months away from the sufferings of Jesus. And Jesus has hinted about his sufferings and death earlier when he's talking about the bridegroom will go away. Or like he compared himself to Jonah that he will be three days in the, in the bosom of the earth but this is when he started talking to them directly and clearly until this time Jesus was exposing the need of the gospel by presenting them then the, the law and saying you need something greater than the law and your resources he but he never explained the gospel yet he didn't preach the gospel yet clearly you know, we back from 2,000 years, we kind of supply, you know, whatever we know to these passages. But these disciples, they haven't heard gospel clearly yet. It's an important impress, expression here of, from this time because this is a new stage in Jesus' interaction with his disciples. To prepare them for the horrible events that's got, that are about to happen. They do not understand Jesus as suffering Messiah yet. What they do understand, that Jesus is the sovereign Lord. He is Christ. He is the son of the living God. We just had the sec section when Peter proclaimed Jesus exactly that. He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And, believer, and, and these disciples believe in Jesus as the son of God and righteous king of Israel. But they have no place in their brain. For the suffering Messiah. You know, filled with popular Jewish conception, Jesus would, you know, have to repeat this message all over, all over again, but never get through until he actually resurrected from the dead. You know, they admitted Jesus as the king. In fact, they're already being prepared to sit right with him in Jerusalem and the throne. That's what we've been waiting for. And when that didn't happen, remember what, what two people, two disciples, unidentifiable disciples going to Jerusalem from Emmaus. And they said, but we were hoping. What were they hoping for? That it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all of this, this third day since there, these things happened. That was their hope. The sovereign king, the sovereign Lord, the son of the living God will restore peace and to kingdom in Israel, but restore it through the military conquest and not through the suffering on the cross. But Jesus said, I must. I must. He must suffer to make the gospel available. Look with me, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that what? That he must. That he must. This is a super important word, must, which shows that he describes the necessity the absolute necessity for the provision for sin. It absolutely must happen. What was the reason for it? It was not incidental. Jesus would not just stumble over and they will arrest him and kill him. No, the word is here to stress out the disciples' needs, the world's needs of the cross of Jesus. There's absolute necessity for him to die. To gospel happen. Jesus must die. Since God is love and man is sinner, he will provide a salvation for them. But, he, but since he's also just, it is necessary 
for him to send his son to bring penalty for sin. Because without sufferings of Jesus, there is no forgiveness of sin. And some say, well, this passage is not about the forgiveness. It's not about the gospel. It's not about, it's about our sacrifices and stuff. But no, it is necessity for the provision of sin. And that's what was so shocking to everybody. So shocking to the disciples that Jesus is talking about his cross. And Jesus said, look, this is what's going to happen to me. They're going to take me. I will suffer and I'll die, and I resurrect it. Mark tells us that Jesus is going to be rejected by men like a gold coin. He would be examined and rejected as a fake one because that's not the Messiah that they've been waiting for. It's not their standard of Jewish Messiah. But what is this gospel that Jesus must do? This is the good news that he's doing. He's doing the substitution for our sins. He must suffer many things from elders and priests and It's interesting, it's super important also to notice why does he bring into equation that he has to suffer from the elders and chief priests and scribes? Why does he say that? Just a few reminders of the bigger context. Jesus has started talking about the wrong system of salvation from Matthew chapter 5. And he exposed in that. And the, the leaders of that system is Pharisees and scribes and elders. And he's, he just warned uh, uh, disciples earlier in, the, in this, uh, in this uh, chapter, 16, verse 11. He says, beware of the leaven of Pharisees and Sadducees. And you have to ask, what is the leaven? What is the problem? What is that thing that corrupts the dough? What is that thing that, that penetrates everything? You could have perfectly good dough, but you put yeast in it just like penetrates to all things. And this is it. I'll tell you what it is, what Jesus is all against. He said, the grace of God plus work of man equals salvation. That's their leaven. They're adding their works. And you see, Israel and disciples and all the Israelites, they didn't think about themselves like, oh, we're self-righteous. We don't need grace at all. That's not what they're thinking. The, the, the greatest Pharisee, they knew that they need grace. In fact, they believed in grace. They believed that they'd been Chosen by God, not because they deserve it, but because God decided to choose them. God chose Abraham. God also chose to give them Moses. God also chose to give them law. That was all grace. They didn't think that, oh, we deserve somehow. That would be foolish. God gave them the presence of the, of the word of God. And they knew that this is grace. What they added is in saying, we know that we got into this grace by his grace alone, but now we have to keep ourselves in the graces of God, and now we have to do and keep ourselves by obedience. And that is the leaven. And that is the leaven. And Jesus exposed, and I just remind you from the context, again, Matthew 15, 17, he says, well, if your righteousness will not surpass that righteousness of Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, that was a shocker for them. Like, what? The best of the best. Later in Matthew 7, he provides the, the, the Proverbs about two foundations. And he said, if you build on a rock, you will stand. But if you build on a sand, you will lose. So you, if you build on a system that, ra- that builds on Christ alone, you will stand. But if you build on something else, on your effort and your selfish, uh, self-centered uh, and, and addition to the grace, you will sink. Matthew 9, 17, he says, Proverbs about the new wineskins and old wineskins, remember that? Never made sense, like what is he talking about? This is the new system that is by grace alone, or the old system that add in the, the work. You can't mix them together, they're going to rip apart one another. Remember Jesus is saying, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth, and I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. What is he talking about here? For I came to set a man against his father and daughter and against her mother and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus, you just preached about loving your neighbor. What are you saying that we have to hate mom and dad? But he's talking about the system. If your mom and dad is soaking that self-righteous system and they're in this teaching, they will revolt against you because you will preach the pure grace and they don't like it. Gospel is the news where Jesus works, not us. Don't mix our responses to the gospel. 
because you corrupt the gospel by that. Our faith is not the good news. Our full work is not the good news. Our fruit of the Spirit is not the good news. Everything that you and I are doing is not the good news. We can't produce the good news. Jesus is the gospel maker. He must go and die. And he pays for the gospel. The theology without Messiah's cross is a demon theology on the other hand. And I like Peter. And Peter is the, is the greatest illustrator. He's the greatest light bulb in, in the Bible. Like he helps us so much to understand this, his theology, but also theology that was common in Israel. Because Peter's plan of salvation requires only Messiah the lion, but not Messiah the lamb. Peter's plan of salvation was the conquest, but not the sufferings. Now, we see in the example of Peter that he was just announced the rock, but how he fast he sank into the down deep of the sea. How he became from the rock to the stumbling block. Peter just pronounced Jesus as Messiah, the Christ, the Son of living God. God has revealed his amazing revelation to him. He knows where Jesus came from, and he knows who he is by nature. But Peter doesn't understand what is his mission. What is his mission? You see, Peter was ready for the kingdom, kingdom to come. If you would offer Peter to storm Jerusalem with just the 12 of them and Jesus on their side, I'll tell you, I believe that he would take the sword and say, well, let's go, baby. Let's take him down. And Jesus would say, well, but in the time that we will, you might die. And what? he said, that's fine. He already did that in the Gethsemane. He took the sword out. He proved that he was not afraid to die. Because the kingdom was, was there, right? It was obvious for him and his friends that they need Jesus to go to Jerusalem, to put Jesus in his righteous place, and that through that, the Israel will be restored and have peace. And that's why Peter reacted as he reacted. You know, Peter's reaction, it's incredible. Like I haven't seen anybody do that, pull that thing on Jesus. He's, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. You know what just Peter did? Peter just denied the need for Jesus' suffering and his death, and therefore he denied his salvation. There's no way that he will be saved. Jesus, Peter was not too sentimental. He was not just cared for Jesus that that not happened to him. What was at stake, it's the whole system of salvation. People, Peter was not afraid, I don't believe. You know, later on, he will reject Jesus because of his weak faith. But at this moment, the whole plan of being, bringing peace to Israel and for all plan of hope of restoration and righteousness in Israel was at stake here. Peter waited the restoration of Israel. It was promised through the prophets. In fact, all the disciples were consumed with this idea of Jesus taking over. And they were asking Jesus, can we sit on right and left places in your kingdom when you come? And they thought that was right there. Right there, just maybe a few months away. And when Jesus mentioned this, that he will die, hope. Hope was shattered. I don't even believe that they heard the last statement that Jesus had to suffer from the elders and then he will be killed. And that is it. That, 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 that's where he lost them. They didn't hear about the resurrection. That after three days he will be resurrected. And that's why G. Peter is so first forceful and he said, Psst, Jesus, come here. Before you get yourself in trouble more, please you know, let me, let me talk to you about the plan of salvation because this is just, you know, something is off. Let me tell you something. And he took him aside and he began rebuking him, expressing strong disapproval. I don't approve this message, Jesus. This is not what we believe. This is what, not what's supposed to happen. God forbid it, literally. May God be merciful to you. May, may he be merciful to you. I mean, something is off. This shall never happen to you. I wish this will never happen. I was wrong with Peter, his theology, his theology. Peter's theology was not that far from the Pharisaic theology, knowing that he was a sinner. He knew that he was a sinner. We know he expressed this in the boat with Jesus. He said, step away because I'm the sinful person. 
He confessed that, but somehow he missed that he can't just hang out with Jesus. And he can't just reign with Jesus apart from the Jesus cross. You see, the problem is that he didn't think that his sin must be paid for. He thought that somehow, since you walk with Jesus for so long, since you know him by name, since he sings with him in the church, since he listens to his sermons, somehow he will be reigning with him. And he will enter into the kingdom of God. But where was the cross in Jesus' theology, in Peter's theology? The suffering Messiah is missing. This revelation was so shocking that Jesus had to repeat this several times. Several times we'll meet in, 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 in this Matthew passages. See, God's plan of salvation requires Jesus' sufferings. Why do we see Jesus reacting so strongly to the strong reaction of Peter? <laughs> because as for Peter was held to die on. For Jesus was the hill to die on. I'm sure Jesus heard many things that they said, many stupid things, many unbiblical things, and he just said, no, that's fine. That's fine. But not this one. Not this one. Brothers and sisters, I haven't seen Jesus so serious. Not just with people around. We saw him. He's going to get on with the people who are religious leaders. He will... Tell them very sharp things, but not with his disciples. This is the first time that he took G. Peter aside and he said, You are Satan. See, three things Jesus is doing here. Because he recognized this, that the gospel is at stake. And he said, by asking Jesus to avoid sufferings, Peter played into satanic schemes. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus said. Satanic tactic was to deceive people for their own, for their need of Jesus that is not based on on their provision for sins. He did it pretty good before, and he's doing an amazing job today, this Satan. Peter literally stood in the place of Satan, preventing Jesus to go on the cross. And the word Satan literally means adversaries. Imagine Jesus is saying to Peter, you're an enemy of the cross. You're an enemy of salvation. By setting his mind on men, by, by, by opposing Jesus going to the cross, Peter became a stumbling block to his own salvation. Peter was trying to keep the Lord from dying, but that was a primary reason why Jesus came into this world. A stumbling block literally means it's a trap. Is setting up a trap for animals. Dig a hole, cover it with leaves, set a trigger, and then when the trigger is charged by animals, the animal gets trapped. Without understanding it, Peter played Satan's role in setting up the trap for Jesus. And third, by setting his mind on man's interest, Peter was opposing God's interest of saving people. With a sharp rebuke, Jesus confronts Peter, misunderstanding of the Messiah's ultimate mission. See, the first point in this passage is that the hope of our salvation is built on Jesus' sacrifice alone. Now, here's where it gets tricky. The tricky gets when we go to verses 24 to 28. And here's what I say that your salvation is it doesn't depend on your sacrifices at all. Because if you accept the first statement that it's only on Jesus' sacrifice, then it cannot be both. The necessity of your cross. Jesus then said to his disciples, and it's interesting, Mark is saying in verse chapter 8, 34, kind of talking about the same things, that Jesus at this point summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Maybe that was early, maybe it was this different thing, but the point is that Jesus is saying now to his disciples, 
to his followers. Jesus told us what he must do, but now he's telling us what is absolute necessity for every person before he follows Jesus. Did you get it from the title of the sermon? Before you follow Jesus. Peter and disciples are not that far from the Pharisaic and Sadducee, Sadducees teaching. We didn't need the sufferings of Jesus. And Jesus has just warned disciples about the leaven and teaching the, of the Pharisees. But, and so now he's saying, if you want to follow me, you have to reject something. You have to deny something. You have to crucify something. You have to die for something. And the statement, if, check with me. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me. It's very important as well because the statement, if, if, He's not saying, when you follow me, then you will have to deny self, suffer, and ultimately die. He's not saying that. He said, if you have in mind, if you wish to follow me. You haven't. You haven't. If you wish. If you just wish to follow me, from the very first step, you must decide three things. To abandon yourself, to take up your cross, and willing to die. In that way, Jesus is not talking about your potential denial, your potential sufferings, or your potential death. No, he's saying that before you follow him, before you are able to follow me, you must do that after. Otherwise, if you follow without those steps, you're not following me. And it happened to every person. It's not just a calling for the super duper spiritual people. You know, he's not calling to the missionaries to Japan. Like, if you want to follow me, like, you have to drop it. And some of us will go to Japan, and some of us do that. No, he's talking about a common, very bottom line discipleship. If anybody wants to follow me, he said, if anybody, if you just want to have idea to follow me, and it's not just a subjective calling, oh, for me, this means this, to follow Jesus. But for me, it means this, you know. This, follow, this, this, this steps of abandoning yourself and taking up your cross precedes all of your sacrifices, precedes all of your fruitfulness, precedes all of your ministries, precedes all of your glorious deeds that you are going to walk as Christian. It's before. See, the problem is that we're supplying our own information and our definition into this cross-carrying and self-denial language. We vaguely understand self-denial and cross-bearing to mean that discipleship is probably difficult and itself is somehow the problem, right? And if we try to rely on our association with these ideas, we will likely misunderstand the Jesus meaning. For instance, if we consider how we pursue self-denial, we might find that we associate denying yourself with denying our desires, That's how we usually think. Because self refers to us and what we want and add a direct object to deny self so that it becomes deny yourself some things. Deny yourself some food. Deny yourself some comfort. Or whether that material objects or immaterial things such as success, love, or meaningful work, denying the self's desire is a common misunderstanding of self-denial. Or when we're talking about the cross-bearing, perhaps even more misunderstanding. We have our crosses to bear. We all have our crosses to bear, we say, right? You know, you have the jet lag from going to the missionary trips like, oh, man, I have my cross. You have a difficult situation at your work. Well, that's my cross to bear. You have a nagging wife. Oh, that's my cross to bear, right? You have, like, temptation, long-term sickness, or difficult relationship. Oh, that's my cross to, to take. No, that's not your cross, This is absolutely not your cross. Here are the things that we must proceed and must do before following Jesus. And Jesus said, number one, the self-denial, let's talk about a little bit. The self-denial or denying self, meaning abandoning, betraying. And a good example, again, guess who? Peter. He's the greatest example of all because he denied Jesus. 
when he was in his weakness presented with the idea that Jesus is his Lord and that's his Messiah, he abandoned him like the rat abandoned sinking ship. He abandoned, he said, well, I do not know the man. In fact, he curses. He said, I have no idea who that is. He just abandoned completely. Betray. Disown yourself. You know, we must disown ourselves, but in what way? In what way are you going to disown? In what way did you disown yourself? In what way you betray yourself? In what way you are denied yourself? And if you're telling me that you're denying some desires, but you keep some desires, it doesn't tell me that you're denied. It's not a complete denial. It's just a partial denial, Okay. You could deny some desires, but you could pick this, the other one. Besides, all of you are living in a comfortable houses. And after the sermon is over, you're going to go and eat a nice meal. When millions of people are without shelter and hungry. And if you're denying yourself in that sense, then what's happening? See, there are the first two common interpretations. Number one, the wrong one, I believe, that you must deny sin. And that you must deny comfort of your life for the sake of the ministry. For example, I could, I could attest this. Instead of sitting in the comfort of your home, you drop everything and move to Los Angeles to study at the Master's Seminary. You could do that. The action requires a lot of sacrifices. It requires change of career, uprooting the family for the kids, change in schools, change in friends. It's a big deal for a wife, cost of abandoning at home, church, and really meet the unknown how the family would survive, what would have anything on the food, on the table, what would happen next, would your church support us, and so on. A lot of sacrifices, but this is not what Jesus means by self-denial. This is the fruit. This is the result, but that's not what he's asking. He said, before you follow me, you must deny yourself. And the second most probable and biblical interpretation is Jesus is not calling his disciples to glory, to glorious ministry, to sacrificial ministry. He's calling them to humility, to admit their total inability to be saved on their own accord. He calls them to admit the unfortunate reality that their complete failure to please God, that their system is collapsed. He calls them to admit that they are losers who believe in humanistic theology and are worthy to be called Christ criminals. And who are worthy to go to hell. And if you don't do that, you haven't denied yourself. Whatever you're going to add to that, it doesn't man matter. Trusting in the system that is founded upon your own achievement and good works must be denied. And what it is... Jesus is really saying in Matthew chapter 3, and this is a commentary on Matthew chapter 3, verse 5, uh, verse 3, when he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. From then, Jesus exposing this, the bankruptcy. You have to admit that you're bankrupt. You come to Jesus not like you can, but you, that you can The self-denial is to deny every possible ability to please God and to enter heaven apart from Jesus. Interesting, Hendrickson said, to deny ourselves means to renounce the old self and self as it is apart from regenerated grace. A person who denies himself gives up all reliance on whatever he is by nature and depends for salvation on God alone. We must deny completely, not partially. These two commandments to deny and to take up your cross in Greek appears in past tense, which usually means non-repetitive action. And at that time, Jesus is calling to deny not just a wishy-washy denial, not just occasional denial, but once for all. So when you came to Jesus, what did you deny of? May I ask you a question? What did you deny? In what sense did you deny self? Did you deny sin? 
Did you deny comfort? Did you give up all your possessions like Jesus told us to do? In what sense you gave up all? Because I see you wa- you you walking in a nice dresses, and I see you driving nice cars. In what sense did you deny yourself? Let me ask you. You know, some people say this passage is really calculating your cost of discipleship. Like you have to sit down and calculate whether it's worth it, right? Whether it's worth it. Like, is it worth it to go to heaven by the sufferings and stuff? Is it worth to deny yourself to gain another life? Is it worth it? But, but Jesus is not asking for us to sit analytically to calculate whether it's worth it. He said, you calculate whether you have the means to buy in. If you have five bucks and you want to build a house... You will look like a fool if you start. You dig the trenches and you, have, you go to Home Depot and say, well, I have $5, I need to build this castle. You look like a fool. People will laugh at you. And Jesus said, look, before you commit to me, do you think you have what it takes? You don't. Jesus gave this illustration. If you have 10,000 soldiers and there's an army going against you for 20,000, would you think that you're going to win? Calculate the cost. No, calculate whether you're able. And so this whole system has to come to crumble and say, well, we're not able. I tell you what you denied when you came to Jesus. You denied self-reliance for salvation. Not just counting the cost. You already counted the cost and you said, well, I'm bankrupt. I'm bankrupt, Jesus. I don't need to show me, show you my, my, what I could do for Jesus, you know. I need grace and mercy. Can you save me? Can you save me? By grace alone, based on your sacrifice alone. Self-denial. What does it mean following Jesus in taking up your cross? Before you follow Jesus, he said, you need to take your cross. What is your cross? At this moment, I want you to fly back with me almost 2,000 years, and sit in the place of disciples. And I'll tell you what you know now. Just, just forget what you know. But i tell you what do you know as disciples about the cross. They haven't heard a boo from Jesus about his cross yet. He talks about his sufferings here, but he doesn't tell them about his cross. They do not know how he would die. They do not know that he will be crucified in most gruesome death on the cross. They have no idea. When they hear that Jesus is saying, take up your cross, we are supplying this, that this is some kind of sacrificial ministry for Jesus. But he said, well, no, 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 no. You have to deny yourself in every effort that you could please God. You are nothing. You're a banker. But now when they hear of the cross, you know what they hear? They hear what everybody Years. I know who's carrying the cross. I know. Criminals carrying the cross. People who are worthy to die, people who, who did so many sins that they are going to put on the cross for their deeds. The cross was a symbol of shame. Today, the cross is an accepted symbol of love and sacrifice. But in that day, the cross was a horrible means of capital punishment. The Romans would not mention the cross in polite society. In fact, the Roman citizen could, be, could not be crucified. This terrible days was reserved for their enemies, for the criminals. The cross was a symbol of shame. Taking up the cross... Your cross in that time would equivalent of taking you an electrical chair today. I mean, just imagine you're dragging the electrical chair behind you with the sign, a criminal worthy to die. You're going with the noose around your head and saying, I'm criminal. I did this and I'm worthy to die. Our care and of cross is not like Jesus carrying his cross. When Jesus carried his cross, he carried as an innocent man. When we are carrying our cross, we're carrying as criminals. 
we admitting the guilt before him. And we're convinced that there's nothing in ourselves which save us from this cross. When disciples have heard that they probably shiver it. What are you talking about? That we're the sinners? We are the criminals? That we have to admit it to the whole world? And Jesus says, yes, because God sees you that way. Taking up your cross does not mean to prove your loyalty to Jesus. It is a confession that you are worthy of death. It is a, not a call to ministry, but it is a call to humility. It is not calling to the triumphal life now. It is calling to your humble admission. Salvation is only by grace. And if I, in this case, with carrying my cross, admitting my guilt, will be saved, it would be pure grace. So this statement must It's showing us that we have to abandon everything and admit who we are before God saves us. It's really talking about your conversion. Really talking about your regeneration. Really talking about who who you know who you are. I like this interesting commentator. I'm not going to tell you who that is. But how, how they interesting say that the taking up your cross meanings to prove the loyalty to Jesus. It says this, salvation is undoubtedly undoubtedly of grace. It is offered freely in the gospel to the chief of sinners without money and without price. And I love it. This is pure gold. But this is where it got tricky. By grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But... All who accept his grace, this great salvation, must prove the reality of their faith by carrying the cross after Jesus. So now we add into the gospel that we must prove it, that we are worthy, and that we are really saved by carrying the cross. Are you serious? If that would depend your salvation on, we'd all be lost and damned long time ago. How are you carrying up your cross in that way? I'm telling you how. You're losing. We carry the cross as a symbol of glory. The cross as a symbol of shame. And the third thing that Jesus is saying here, so you have to deny yourself. Deny your all reliance on self and, you, and the system, whatever a system is. And people say, well, it doesn't matter. You know, every system kind of goes to God and leans to God. But No. Every system provides no provision for salvation or supplies that you could somehow pay for your sins. Buddha and Muhammad and all other things. And only Jesus said, I have the payment and that is the only payment you need. The third thing that is requirement for you to, for before you follow Jesus is probably the hardest one. He's talking death to yourself. Choosing to follow Christ means to lose your life. You see what he says here? He says, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Losing self-right, losing some comfort or losing your life, he's talking about. Again, we're not talking about potential loss of physical life, which is, could happen to you. Even, but a loss that happens before you follow Jesus. Somehow, you have to lose your life before you follow Jesus. And the big question is, how do you lose your life? To gain another one. We're trying to make this to mean that we must use this life for Jesus. You know, like, I lost it for myself, but I found it for Jesus kind of deal. So I bought the Tesla, but it's really for Jesus, you know. I'm, you know, it's all for the ministries. How can we lose this life to gain eternal life? Another question. We're saying that we'll lose the rights on our lives, but the text does not say that. It says that we must lose the life itself in order to find it. The life in its entirety must be lost. 
Our life as a non-Christian, self-reliant saint must be completely lost. It cannot be recovered. It cannot be restored. It cannot be reconstructed. It cannot be transformed. It must be lost. If we say that the requirements to lose life is to lose all the rights on your life, then we are all doomed because we're not doing good. At what point do you think you have completely denied your flesh? If that's what Jesus is talking about. At what point do you think you're denying your dreams? At what point do you think you have forsaken all your sins? And if you think that you didn't, then what kind of loss is this? The only thing that could cause us to lose our hope for eternal life is if we reject the gospel. How are we doing on that? So we can justify our efforts that we are trying. You know, we're really trying Jesus, but Jesus does not give us this privilege. He says clearly, one must lose his life. Did you lose it? Did you lose it? Another question Jesus posing, what can we give for exchange of our souls? For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And Jesus is saying that you can use all your life here, all, not just sin, but for good, all of it. Whatever you're able to gain from this life, your life with all of it, with entirety, vices and virtues, good and evil, cannot buy eternal life. That's the question. What can you give for your soul? This life must be lost. You cannot transform it. You cannot make it as a payment for your soul. Do you want to give this life to God? God would put this life in the garbage, in eternal death, because this life is worth nothing. Do you think this life is dedicated to Jesus that could buy you way to heaven? A life that was good and honorable, devoted to God. You know what Paul said that we read earlier? He said, I was a good boy. I was really a good boy. I was a good man. Better than many, he said. If I could compete with you in my goodness. He's not talking about, hey, I was sunk in pornography and idolatry and this is what God saved me. No, he said, I am the greatest chief sinner with all this good stuff. And he said, all this good life, all of it, what I did with the zeal of God, with my reading of scripture, with my understanding in theology and mission, I took this and counted as a loss. I don't count it as this would, would give me any access, any bearing with God. And I died. And I died. When Jesus is talking about what will it profit a man if he does gain the whole world and forfeits his soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul, he's talking about the impossibility. You absolutely must forfeit your right and your understanding of that you could gain somehow privilege with God apart from pure grace. But you know what? We love the other side. We really love the spiritual, you know, glorious preaching. I preached for many years exactly the opposite from this passage. I preached that call into a glorious triumphal living because it preaches well. It preaches well. You come to church, you feel like you're not really good. You're not really doing good. You're really not sacrificing for God. You're really not giving your life for God. You come to the church, and I preach to you and say, well, you must do this for Jesus. Unless you do that, you will be lost. So go ahead and do it. And you pumped up, and you just go. You come back next time, and I ask you, I take this two-by-four spiritual and hit you with it and say, well, how are you doing, brothers and sisters? We must do more. But that is discourages because I know who I am. 
And I know that my place at the cross and this, that I take my cross, I deny every right to be saved on my own. I take my cross, and you know what I do with my cross? I carry it out daily until I come and meet Jesus at his cross. Meet Jesus at his cross when he takes my cross upon himself. And then I no longer carry it because I'm done. I'm saved. He is the sacrificial lamb. And yes, I will go and sacrifice my life for him. And yes, I will walk in the good works that he prepared for me. And yes, I will be zeal for preaching this gospel. And yes, for this gospel, I am ready to die. Before the cross of Jesus, before you met him at the cross, you're a criminal. But when you meet Jesus at the cross, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. Romans 6.6 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Second Corinthians 6.11 Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. I would say that we are no longer cross bearers. Because Jesus took up your cross. Here's the thing. We are to carry our crosses to Jesus. So that he can crucify us together with him upon his cross. As we come to him with full confession. That we are incomplete. Sinful. Without any resources for righteous living. He's been kind. In his mercy. By his work. Sanctify us and accept us into his kingdom. Surrender to him if you didn't. Now, it's interesting that these two verses, verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come into glory to his Father, of his Father with his angels, and will then repay every man according to his deed. He's talking about when Jesus comes at second coming, if you didn't surrender to the gospel, if you have any other deeds that you want to present with him, the books will be open. And if you're not written in a book of life, then you will be open your books, and every deed will be will be. Observe and, and wait it. But get this, you don't go to the judgment seat of God, to the white, great white throne, because you have sinned. No. You go there because you have not trusted Christ. But if you get there, all the books of your deeds will be open. And now, since you didn't want to be justified by Christ alone, now you will be justified or try to justify it by your deeds. And it says everyone who was written in those books were thrown into the lake of fire because they stand no chances. And the last verse is really a positive verse. We're not going to have some time in it, but truly, truly, I say to you, there's some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What is Jesus talking about here? I think he's talking about, I mean, some disciples will see him in, in this position, what we were, they were looking for. They were looking to see him as a king, righteous king who is ready to reign. And that happened only after resurrection. Judas didn't see that. He died. But some did. They saw him in the power of this gospel that make him king over the earth. Yeah, his kingdom didn't take place yet, but he will. That was a foretaste of this powerful ministry of the gospel. You know, this whole passage telling us about the full completion of Christ's work upon our behalf and complete inability of ours. And if that doesn't bring you hope, I don't know what will. 
on the Christmas day, year 800 exactly, King Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, was crowned by the Pope to be a king in Rome. And it was a big deal, because before that, Europe was disunified, conquered, invasion by barbarians and, uh, and stuff. And he was the king of Franks that was called the father of Europe because he unified Europe and Christianized most of its parts. Yes, Christianization was back then baptize or die kind of deal. But he did. And was a king of great fame and great riches. 180 years after the death of Charlemagne, about the year 1000, Officials of the Emperor Otho opened the great king's tomb, where in addition to incredible treasures, they saw an amazing sight. The skeletal remains of King Charlemagne seated on the throne. His crown still on his skull, a copy of gospel laying in his lap with his bony finger resting on the text. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, and yet forfeit his soul. It's that serious. Apart from the work of Christ alone, on our behalf, we have nothing to boast about. Don't boast in your sacrifices. Don't boast in your great deeds. Boast in Christ alone. For those who believe in Jesus, you have been crucified already with Christ. We are bearing the testimony of Jesus now, not our crosses. We're bearing the testimony. Our cross are sh uh, shattered at the foot of Jesus. Our shame is removed. Our guilt is recovered and covered up. Your sins are forgiven. We must walk in this gospel. Now, go and suffer for Jesus. Now, go and live for his glory. Now, go serve until you bleed. Go and preach the gospel, preach salvation by grace alone, and you will see how people will react and how will hate you and persecute you for it because you remove the last hope from under their feet. Be blessed. Amen. Father, we thank you for the privilege to know Jesus. He is our only hope. And he is our greatest motivator to live for him true. We want to. We want to. Knowing what you have done for us. How anybody would be dull of heart not to respond with the great sacrifices and ministries and, and glory. And sometimes we find ourselves dull trying to motivate ourselves with the sacrifices of ours. We get dull because that is not a motivating factor. You have paid for our sins and you have bought a right to be at the right hand of Jesus. The only thing that could buy the eternal life is the sacrifice of Christ paid with the blood of Jesus. We thank you for that. Be glorified. Amen.